This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it. June 21st, Happy Father's Day. What Priscilla just played, we'll sing in just a moment. This is my father's world, one of my favorite hymns, the beauty of the, the melody and the text. But just a couple of days ago, it seems, we played that for Gail Shue's father's funeral, Bill Griffith. And so I'm mindful of that. And for all those who mourn the death of their fathers, whether a long time ago or just recently. So happy Father's Day. And our flowers on the altar today are not for Father's Day, but they are because someone made someone else a father. Happy birthday, Sarah Uzarski. We're sorry that you have to share your flowers with us fathers this day. But congratulations to your dad, Doug, on becoming a father on this day, what, 19 or so years ago? God bless you all, and God bless fathers, including those with us here this morning. Larry and Jody, Darren and Chris, Mitch and Jim, and then the list would go on to each one of you at home as you remember your dads and as you celebrate Father's Day with your dads. Our call committee yesterday posted a video of a little bit what they are up to. I call your attention to St. Mark's website so you can see the video. Jeff Shu and, and Bill Elkin posting that video a little bit more about St. Mark's and the call committee, that update. We look forward to continuing updates or continual updates from them. And just a note about uh, uh, prayer concerns this day, our first reading is by Tommy Lyons, who made a miraculous m recovery after going to the hospital on Tuesday for an emergency appendectomy and a twofer because he also had a hernia repair at the same time. And then he was strong enough to recover to read our first reading for us this day. Thank you, Tommy. And then also Jimmy Arthurs was in the hospital for a bit uh, on Friday and Saturday and is now back home as well. Thanks be to God. So thanks be to God as we gather for worship in the name of the Trinity, one God whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed by your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven in Christ's name. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us pray. Teach us, good Lord God, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for reward, except that of knowing that we do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, amen. Amen. For our offering, just a, a word about our offering this day. There's a note in the bulletin that says, thank you, and a fun little line from the Hello Dolly show. But it's Father's Day, and the Hello Dolly part is more for my mom, I think, the, the musicals. My dad was more into, or still is, into the classicals, the Brahms and Beethoven and Tchaikovsky and Vivaldi and pieces like that. But dad is also into stewardship. I've probably used this illustration several numerous times. But with regards to dad and how dad made sure I had my quarter every Sunday morning when I was a kid in my offering envelope to take to church and or to Sunday school and to put that quarter in and to help place it in the offering plate. But as I grew older, Dad kept encouraging me to give more, not just quarters anymore, but to continue to contribute, as Dad has so generously con contributed to the church local as well as to the church national and to many other wonderful, powerful, and worthy ministries. Thank you, Dad, and thanks be to God for the stewardship of you all. Let us sing together the doxology. first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 7 through 13. O Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out. I must shout, violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot, for I hear many whispering. Terror is all around. Denounce him. Let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed and we can prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble, and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution upon them. For to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of evildoers. Here ends the reading. Our Heavenly Father's love is a beautiful example for all earthly fathers. He himself is the mold from which earthly fatherhood was formed. But not only is he their example, he offers himself as their source of strength and wisdom and love. By his Holy Spirit, he can make fathers more and more like himself. May that be the prayer for all fathers to grow more and more like their heavenly father.
is from the sixth chapter of Romans. In baptism, we were incorporated into the reality of Christ's death and resurrection. We have been made new in Christ through his death and resurrection to live freed from sin. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Here ends the reading. Thank you very much, Leslie, for reading that for us. Leslie Karen Leonard and that cross, the resurrection cross behind her, reminding us of death and resurrection of Easter That reading has been used in funerals by me as well as by my father and grandfather for years and years. Here's a picture taken 26 years ago when Nina and I were married. And it features my grandfather, Albert H. Keck Jr. on my right shoulder and my father, David R. Keck Sr. on my left shoulder. Happy Father's Day and Grandfather's Day. Now, we don't always or we never turn out like our parents, do we? (laughs) Our fathers or our mothers. In this case, I turned out to be a Lutheran pastor like these two gentlemen on either side of me. And then there are more as well. But I'm not nearly the pastor that they were and that they are. Thanks be to God for them and their ministry. In baptisms, which that text proclaim, as well as in funerals and for everything in between in ministry and in life. But we learn a lot of things from our fathers, like how to use use tools, hammers and and tweezers to pull our teeth out, right? Or to hammer our thumbs. Probably not with our fathers gathered here this day, but sometimes that's what we learn. Or maybe your dad has taught you how to shave, right, Elliot? Yeah, you know, how old are you? You're getting there. Or maybe how to make the perfect cup of coffee for dad in the morning with a lot of sugar. Make sure you add a lot of sugar for your dads, okay? Or maybe your dad just taught you how to play ball, take you out in the backyard, and you guys threw football or baseball, softball, whatever it might be. Playing sports. Or maybe your dad just attended your sporting events, your athletic events, and your school events too. So when I was a kid... My great-grandparents lived in Richmond, Indiana. And on our way up to Richmond, Indiana, one of the things I learned from my parents was to take those family trips in the summer to go see relatives far away. And we would go to Richmond, Indiana, but we would stop in Cincinnati, Ohio, at least so I could go check out a Cincinnati Reds big red machine back in the 1970s baseball game. I still have that. And maybe your dad has taught you how to tie a tie. Do any dads still wear ties, by the way? Or especially during these COVID days? Thanks, Dad, for teaching me how to tie a tie, though. That is a serious thing. We don't always wear collars, do we? And here is a gift from my dad. Really. 
June 7, 1982, my dad signed the book inside. June 7, 1982, Dear Dave, I thought you might enjoy this unusual version. It's been a favorite of mine with lots of love, Dad. So I was 17 years old, and Dad gives me a miniature Bible. Actually, just a cotton patch version of Matthew and John's Gospel of the Bible. A 17-year-old kid getting a cotton patch version of the Bible. I didn't exactly know what it was or what to think, and I'm sure, Dad, I'm sorry, I didn't read it immediately. <laughs> I probably haven't read it, until, I probably didn't read it until I got to seminary several years later. But, but who knew? And I still have that book. But the strange thing is, either through my dad or my granddad, my granddad's books with his signature, Albert H. Keck Jr., ended up on my bookshelf as well. The cotton patch versions of the rest of the New Testament as well as the other two gospel readings, Mark and Luke. So how about that? Thanks to my dad and my granddad, I have all of these New Testament books in the cotton patch version. And I'm going to share another word about that during the sermon time. But back to this tie a moment. This tie is called popsicle faces. It's an old tie of mine. And I think about these faces, blue, green, red, yellow, on the popsicle faces. It was designed by a kid, maybe a kid who saw color amazement in all the faces of the world, or at least the popsicle faces. And I'm reminded of the song, that you all know. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red, brown, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. And I'll say another word about that during the sermon time today too. God bless you children, all the colors of the world, and God bless you fathers as you continue to share your gifts of books, of theology, of of money and offering, of sports, of life with your children. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's sing Children of the Heavenly Father. gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In the 10th chapter, Jesus is talking to his 12 disciples. They are named. He sends them out to cure sicknesses and to cast out demons to do those powerful things. And then he tells them, a disciple is not above the teacher nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? Have no fear of them. For nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. And what I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what, I, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household." Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross, whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. 
Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you O Christ. Christ. Costly grace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The gospel text today began with a disciple is not above the teacher. A disciple means a student, and I've never been above my teachers, and I'm certainly not above teacher Jesus, <laughs> nor a slave above the master. And that word slave hit me. Between the eyes again this week, following Pastor C.C. Mills' sermon this past Sunday, following the Wednesday commemoration of the Emmanuel 9, following Juneteenth this past Friday as well. The last couple of Sundays I began by sharing the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America statement on anti-racism, but there is actually a pledge, an ELCA pledge that's put together, which is just one sentence basically, and it says, sign the pledge below, I commit to study and prayer, and action to become an anti-racist individual in an anti-racist church, and share your participation on social media using hashtag ELCA for justice. This was signed by, well, now thousands of people, but initially it was put together by presiding Bishop Elizabeth Eaton, who preached here a couple of Sundays ago, by Vice President William B. Horn, and a quick note about Mr. Horn. Mr. Horn is retired Air Force. He is African American. He got his undergraduate degree from University of Tulsa. He earned, and that's a Bachelor of Science, he earned a Master's in Human Resource Management from Pepperdine and a Master's of Political Science from Auburn University in Montgomery. After his military career in the Air Force, he has done various things in church as well as in community and most currently the city manager of Clearwater, Florida. He's also been on several different church councils for Lutheran churches where he has been a part of, including where he currently is a member in Clearwater, St. Paul's Lutheran Church. So, Vice President Horn is also signed on here. And then the third signature is the Conference of Bishops Chairperson. There are over 60 bishops in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, including our North Carolina Synod Bishop Tim Smith. The one who is the chair of that group is Tracy Bartholomew. Tracy is the New Jersey Synod Bishop. Tracy is married to one Pastor Danny Whitener. I've I met Danny a couple times throughout the years, including in New Jersey and in North Carolina and in South Carolina once upon a time. Danny's from North Carolina. His father and my father were classmates at Lenore Ryan. His father's name is Boyce Whitener. And Boyce Whitener, like my dad, also became a Lutheran pastor. He served as director of missions in North Carolina for a while, but also served congregations. In one of the congregations, he served just one county over from here. In the midst of the civil rights issues, he talked about having the cross burned into the front yard of his church, not, more, or not just once, but more than once. Pastor Boyce Whitener focused some of his preaching against racism and against hatred even against the KKK. Crosses were burned. Eventually, Boyce's son, Danny, grew up. They also have a daughter named Patty, who lives in Florida. But Danny grew up, became a Lutheran pastor himself, married Tracy Bartholomew, and she's the one who signed this, as well as, like I said, thousands of others who helped pen this document. Maybe you want to check it out today as well. Number two, it says, work to dismantle racial injustice. Among other things, it says, take a look at the Living Lutheran Magazine to see what they're saying. And so Living Lutheran Magazine, this current issue, you can get online. 
It talks about families and how our families all look different within the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America as well as just across the United States. But there is this article from a Lutheran pastor in Alabama in the 1950s. He's the white one in this picture. His name is Robert Gretz. He was from West Virginia, and he went to seminary in Ohio, and then he went to go serve in Alabama. His seminary professors when you were accepting, told him, when you're accepting the call to Alabama, just don't stir up any trouble down there. Pastor Gretz said, I didn't stir up any trouble. Trouble was already there, and I just became part of it. So, there's another picture of him with a book that he wrote in 1999, A White Preacher's Message on Race and Reconciliation, and he's standing pictured with Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the picture. In this particular article, it talks about how one of his neighbors was Rosa Parks, and Rosa's NAACP youth group met at Pastor Gretz Lutheran Church, Trinity Lutheran Church in Alabama. Pastor Gretz is a white pastor, but he was serving an all-black, all-African-American congregation at the time. You can also look up on the internet, Pastor Gretz, and find a couple of different historical biographical videos about Pastor Gretz and his time in Alabama, about having his house firebombed, including when his son, happy Father's Day, Pastor Gretz, his son was nine days old when he and his wife had to flee a burning house. The ELCA statement goes on to say, learn the history of systemic racism in the country and the ways racism and white supremacy impact every aspect of our life together whether it be through Jim Crow or slavery or, or redlining or other concerns years ago as well as modern day. Part of the concern is back to the gospel today or even back to Jeremiah's text or Paul's text. Jeremiah is proclaiming justice, is proclaiming that all people are created by God in the midst of a people who are hell-bent on violence and destruction. Jeremiah is put down for it. Jesus comes along and he speaks to a small group of disciples and he tells them, you are of more value than sparrows, which wasn't saying much, that cost about a penny. <laughs> You're of more value, but do not be afraid. God knows everything about you, but you are going to be working for the kingdom of God. And then, G and then Jesus tells them to take up their cross and to follow him. Which brings me back to Clarence Jordan, the Cotton Patch versions. Clarence Jordan grew up early 1900s in Georgia to a wealthy white family. He went to University of Georgia, studied agriculture, also was participate, participated in the ROTC program, came out of University of Georgia, was going to go into the military, but something got a hold of his heart. It was the Gospel of Matthew, he says. And he started wrestling with, what does it mean to strive for justice and peace? What, is it, what does the Sermon on the Mount mean? What does it mean to take up your cross? And Clarence Jordan instead went to Baptist Theological Seminary instead of going into the military. He got out, became a Baptist minister, got married. A few years after serving in churches, he felt this call. He felt this call to to move to a place just south of Americus, Georgia. 440 acres of nothing, of swamp, of barren, of yuck. And he said, that's a great place. <laughs> Can anything good come out of that place? Pastor Jordan bought that acreage. 440 acres. He learned from the farmers and the sharecroppers around him a little bit more about agriculture in that place, even though he had an agricultural degree. And then he invited some of them to come in and work with him, not for him, but with him. They were different colors of skin, but he came, but as they came to work with him, he also ate dinner with them. His wife said, I'm going to stay at home until this becomes a bit more inhabitable. But Clarence Jordan made friends in the community, but he also made enemies. Because the enemy saw who he was eating with and who he was working with, side by side, shoulder to shoulder, even praying with, even having Bible studies with, and they said, that's not right. There was a Baptist church there that kicked him and some of the other people out of that church when they started 
going to visit with Clarence Jordan on a friendly basis. Eventually, Clarence Jordan and the Koinonia Farm, it took about 10 years or so to get up and rolling, but it, in the 50s, was firebombed, was burned, was shot at. At one time, they had about, they had 40 plus people there, including a lot of children. People started coming to visit, like Dorothy Day, Catholic worker. She was shot at for the first time in her life. Dorothy Day being shot at just for being on the Koinonia farm. People didn't like what Clarence Jordan was doing. One of the famed people who showed up there was a guy named Millard Fuller. Millard shows up. He's a millionaire. He gives most of his wealth to Koinonia Farm. And then, you know what happens next. Among other things, he starts Habitat for Humanity. Equal rights. People with affordable housing. Millard Fuller, Clarence Jordan working side by side. Koinonia Farm, Habitat for Humanity. And that's where this book comes in. Take up your cross and follow me. Clarence Jordan said... There's not a good way to translate the word cross or crucifixion from Greek to English. So Clarence Jordan started using the word lynching throughout this book and through other books. Every time the cross or crucifixion is mentioned, Clarence Jordan, who is white, who is also working with African Americans, calls the cross the lynching tree. This was published in the, before my dad gave it to me, in 1982. This was published in 1957. He didn't finish it. I'm sorry. He didn't finish it until later on, right before he died. This particular chapter of Matthew that we read today, Clarence Jordan translates this, among other things. Don't get the idea that I came to set up peace all over the world. I didn't come to establish peace, but strife. For I came to split a man from his father. Happy Father's Day. Clarence Jordan also knew what it was like to be abandoned by his own father. A daughter from her mother, a bride from her mother-in-law, a man's foes will be his own family. Clarence Jordan made friends and family members from foes. Anybody who puts his parents above me is not my man, and anybody who puts his children above me is not my man. And whoever does not accept his own lynching. He said the cross is too pretty. It's too embellished. He was talking to a Baptist preacher one day. The Baptist preacher bragged there in Georgia, that cross cost our church $10,000. And Clarence Jordan replied, there was a day when you could get them for free. Anyone who does not accept his own lynching and share my life is not my man, says Jesus. The person who hoards his life throws it away, and the one who abandons his life for my cause discovers it. I think Jesus' call is to pro proclaim the kingdom of God in, through word and through deed, through social justice activities, even through signing an anti-racism pledge to working as my daughter. Happy Father's Day, my daughter says. 22 years ago, she made me a dad. She told me to watch the movie 13th the other day. Dad, you got to watch 13th. Rachel, I haven't finished watching it, but I did start it, and I have watched some of it. On June 10th, Juneteenth the other night, I watched a bit of the movie Selma. I saw it several years ago. Selma is a hard movie to watch. In the midst of Selma, Martin Luther King Jr. has this nonviolent protest, although three people get killed eventually, two white people and one young black man. The white people are there to help King protest. Martin Luther King Jr. finds himself in jail. He is depressed. He is worried. He is sad. And Ralph Abernathy is sitting right beside him on his left side in the jail cell or right side. I don't remember which now. And he's sitting right there. And Ralph Abernathy starts quoting today's gospel reading to Martin Luther King Jr. They said it really happened. Ralph Abernathy quotes to Martin, Do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, and even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid, Martin. You are of more value than many sparrows. Martin Luther King Jr., like Jeremiah, like Jesus, like countless others, 
proclaimed social justice. It cost him his life. And yet at the same time, Jesus reminds us, do not be afraid. Black lives matter. So, do, do, so does yours. God is with you. Amen. Sevilla Martin came down from Canada to visit friends in New York, and she visited the friend, the last name were the Doolittles, and she visited the Doolittles, and Mr. Doolittle took care of Mrs. Doolittle. Mrs. Doolittle had been bedridden for 20 or so years, and Mr. Doolittle himself was now basically in a wheelchair, and yet he was still helping Mrs. Doolittle. Sevilla Martin asked them, gosh, you guys are so positive, you're so joyful. What's the meaning of that? What's behind all that? 
And Mrs. Doolittle from her bed replied, his eyes on the sparrow and I know he watches me. And Sevilla Martin got the inspiration to write that hymn, which became a whole lot more well-known and powerfully proclaimed by people like Ethel Waters and, and Mahalia Jackson and the African-American community. Maybe even after that movie Selma, when Martin Luther King Jr., or after the first Selma, when Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, used that text and Ralph Abernathy as well. Thanks be to God for Sevilla Martin and the Doolittles and all who are watched over by Jesus. Let us profess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He descended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. Called into unity with one another in the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. Expansive God, you bring diverse voices together to form your church. Open our hearts and unstop our ears to learn from one another that differences might not overshadow our baptismal unity. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Providing God, your creation shows us that life comes from death. Renew the places where our land, air, and waterways have been ill for too long. Direct the work of all who care for birds and their habitats. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy, Your mercy is, is great. great. Protecting God, sustain and keep safe all who work to defend others across the world. Revive and strengthen organizations dedicated to caring for refugees and migrants while their homelands struggle for peace. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy, Your mercy is, is great. great. Loving God, you promise to be with all who are persecuted for your sake. Guide all who speak your word of justice and soul any who are to be tormented or targeted for being who they are. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. Compassionate God, you are with us and we are never alone. Bless all fathers and father figures who strive to love and nurture as you do. Comfort all who long to be fathers and all of whom this day is difficult. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy, your mercy is, is great. great. Father God, this day we lift up to you the prayer concerns of our hearts as well as from our lips. We include our nation's military. We include police forces. We include those who march and protest. We include our Lord's servants from this congregation, people like Tommy Lyons, Ken Kohler, Duncan McDuffie, Ronnie Wilkins, Pat Davis, Charleston Knox, Jimmy Arthurs, Adam Hauser, all COVID-19 victims and those who are working towards helping and assisting with both victims as well as providing for a cure. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is, is great. great. Reigning God, you bless us with guides and caretakers in the faith as we give thanks for those who have died, especially this day, Onesimus Nesib, a translator and evangelist. Increase our care for one another until we walk with them in newness of life. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is, is great. great. Receive these prayers, O oh God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, Our Father, who art, art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me, and his eye is on you. Thanks be to God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Thanks be to God.